Hello, and welcome to today's online forum, Trivializing History, how anti-Israel activists have hijacked the South African apartheid label to attack the Jewish state. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, your moderator for this special event co-hosted by NGO Monitor and the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement. At this gathering, we're bringing together a distinguished group of diplomats, legislators, and policymakers to discuss what must be done to restore the apartheid term to its proper context and to delegitimize its use in discourse about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We're live on Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And don't worry, because if you miss anything, you'll get a recap in your inbox. Plus, a full recording is also going to be made available on the event's website and the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement's social media platforms. Now, recent years have seen a global rise in anti-Semitism, including campaigns questioning Israel's right to exist as a Jewish and democratic state. One such campaign appropriates the term apartheid from its historical South African context, with the goal of defaming and isolating Israel by portraying it as a racist entity. Well, in the past year alone, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International released reports accusing Israel of apartheid, and the UN Human Rights Council established a commission of inquiry for the very same purpose. Attempts to link South Africa's past system of institutionalized racial segregation to the nuanced complexities of contemporary Israeli-Palestinian relations not only debase history, but also trivialize the unique suffering that true South African apartheid victims endured. This campaign has also fueled anti-Semitism worldwide with events such as Israeli Apartheid Week, which incite hatred against Jewish college students all the way from Cape Town to Los Angeles. Now, many prominent world leaders from across the ideological spectrum, some of whom you're going to hear from today, have vocally condemned the campaign. They believe it's a politicized and malicious bid to single out and isolate Israel. So let's get started with our program. Our first guest is Nicola Baer, Vice President of the European Parliament. Her responsibilities include overseeing the Special Envoy on combating religious discrimination, including anti-Semitism. She also chairs the European Parliament's Working Group on Anti-Semitism, and we'd like to thank you, Vice President Baer, for all of your hard work in combating anti-Semitism in Germany and the EU. Take it away. Dear honorable guests, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's an honor for me to address you today. As a Vice President of European Parliament and Special Envoy on Combating Religious Discrimination, one of my highest priorities is to combat anti-Semitism and foster Jewish life around Europe to protect the roots of our continent, which are based on Jewish Christian tradition. It is impossible to imagine Europe nowadays without those roots being present in our culture, legal framework, in our way of life. Unfortunately, anti-Semitic narratives and disinformation are on the rise again. First, the COVID-19 pandemic, and now Putin's brutal war in Ukraine. Both helped spread and manifest anti-Semitic hatred online as well as offline. We have had a disturbing surge in conspiracy theories against Jews since the crisis began. Every such surge of anti-Semitism puts European values, such as respect for democracy, human rights, the rule of law, fundamental freedoms, good governance, and the stability of our society in danger. Therefore, I condemn the claims made by some organizations that Israel has established an apartheid regime. Yes, you heard me correctly. They describe the state of Israel with a term that was used for the strict racial segregation and significant discrimination in an African state. Israel, the only democracy in the region, the only state which offers participation in elections, in education and culture to everyone living legally in its territory. A democracy that allows diverse representations in the Knesset and the government. For example, Arabian and Ethiopian minorities have a voice. Which other country in the region is equally progressive? Categorizing this as an apartheid state is just plain anti-Semitic. In my opinion, such categorization counters any progress 
made in the region concerning the peace process. Instead, it deepens the rifts and fuels anti-Semitism around the world. Instead of blanket accusations, we need more efforts to build bridges. Since March, we have been waiting for an official response by European Commission how to react and how to handle this new surge of anti-Semitism. You see, sometimes parliaments are quicker to react than public administrations. However, let us be pragmatic. We must continue building bridges in the region for the good of all stakeholders and especially to safeguard Israel's regional safety. The Abraham Accords are a significant step in the right direction, yielding the first results. This symbolizes hope. Hope that one day Israelis and Arabs can peacefully live together in the region. I am convinced that the European Union, with its history as a peace project, with its experience to overcome hate and mistrust, must take a more decisive role in advancing the peace process. I want the European Union to change its role from spectator to a proactive actor. First, the relationship Israel and European Union can be strengthened through more common projects. For example, in the field of energy, fintech, security, sciences. Second, the Abraham Accords have the potential to be the game changer in the region. European Union should engage actively to make it happen. The fact that caucuses of parliamentarians are being founded under the umbrella of the Abraham Accords in the region and beyond, such as in the United States, to build a network of supporters amplifies its impact. This can help stabilize the situation even beyond government changes and setbacks. That is why my colleagues and I, with European Parliament's President's support, are taking the initiative to set up such a caucus in the European Parliament. A cross-committee body which works with parliamentarians and representatives in the region on specific projects. For example, in education, to provide good school books without haters, without anti-Semitism. For this reason, I want to encourage all of you. Let us join forces on all levels, so that we, sooner rather than later, build a world without anti-Semitism, without discrimination, without racism, and with respect for all religious beliefs as an integral part of our societies. For this reason, I thank all of you for coming together to discuss how we can collectively combat anti-Semitism and foster Jewish life around Europe and beyond. Thank you, Vice President Baer, for being such an inspiration to us all. We thank you and commend you for all of your work within the European Union, your dedication to defending the Jewish people and to combating anti-Semitism in all of its shapes and forms, including in the false charge of apartheid, is greatly appreciated. All right, we'll now be turning it over to Mr. Alan Shatter. He's the former Minister for Justice, Equality and Defense of the Republic of Ireland and former chairperson of the Irish Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee. Mr. Shatter is a founder of the Ireland-Israel Parliamentary Friendship Group, and he's acted as its chairperson for many years now. Mr. Shatter is also currently a voluntary chairperson of Magin David Adom of Ireland and has proposed motions in the Dale on the Plate of Soviet Jewry. We applaud you, Mr. Shatter, for your dedication to the Jewish people. Lies have always been part of politics going back centuries. Some lies are bigger than others. And a big lie in circulation in recent years is one depicting Israel as an apartheid state. It's a big lie because it is entirely untrue. Israel is one of the most diverse countries in the world and doesn't remotely replicate uh, South Africa as it existed in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. The cruel apartheid regime required black South Africans to go to different schools, sit on different buses, never participate in sports with white South Africans, uh, no representation in the South African government, no representation in the South African parliament. Black South Africans were basically treated as racially inferior to whites and suffered appalling discrimination and were frequently the victims 
of appalling violence. The apartheid lie is about misappropriating the dreadful history of South Africa and applying it to Israel for no purpose other than to delegitimize the Israeli state, demonize the Jewish people, and ultimately bring about Israel's extermination. For anyone like me who visits Israel, you know it's a lie. Israel, Israelis are throughout society represented uh, and engaged with each other. And when I say Israelis, I mean Jewish Israelis, Arab Israelis, Muslim Israelis, Christian Israelis, Druze Israelis, Circassian Israelis, Israelis of no religious belief, Israelis of all backgrounds. Israelis, for example, participate cross community in Magan David Adam, of which I'm the Irish voluntary chairman. Magan David Adam, or MDA, is Israel's emergency medical response organization. There's 25,000 fully trained volunteers from every community in Israel working with each other to save lives. It is two and a half thousand professionally fully employed uh, paramedics engaged also in life saving. There is Israel's ambulance service, blood service. Israel is part of the Red Cross, provides international medical assistance and aid in, when global emergencies occur. As I'm, dictate, as I'm dictating this today or speaking this today, uh, members of Mag and David Adam are providing medical assistance to some of those impacted uh, by the brutal uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. If Israel was an apartheid state, Mag and David Adam in its current form would not have members from every community in Israel working and volunteering in its, in its engagements, nor would it do what it does on a daily basis provide emergency medical assistance to people of all communities required. So why is there a big lie? The big lie derives from those engaged in uh, politics who effectively seek to demonize Israel because of the tragically ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict. That conflict is a conflict about nationality, it's a conflict about territory. It's a conflict about two peoples who want to each have their right to self-determination recognized. It's my hope that ultimately there will be an Israeli state living securely and peacefully next door to a Palestinian state living securely and in peace. But that isn't today's reality because there's no workable peace process. And those who denigrate Israel and labor an apartheid state are not interested in peace not interested in reconciliation, not interested in two states living side by side. Their objective is to internationally undermine Israel's status and to promote a picture of Israel that not simply demonizes Israel as a state and is, demonizes the seven million Jewish people residing in Israel. Their objective is Israel's extermination. Their depiction of Israel as an apartheid state is not merely an inaccurate gross defamation. It's an appalling disservice and misuse of the tragic history of black South Africa. Thank you so much, Mr. Shatter, for your unwavering friendship and for denouncing the apartheid narrative leveraged against Israel. We're now honored to be able to hear from Mr. Yizi Kozak, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs to the Czech Republic. When Amnesty International's deplorable report came out condemning Israel, Deputy Minister Kozak immediately issued a forceful rejection, pushing back against Amnesty's lies. Dear distinguished participants at this conference, ladies and gentlemen, Anyone familiar with life in Israel will know that it is a functioning democracy, far from being an apartheid state. Israel's Arab citizens enjoy equal rights, including voting in the national elections, being elected to parliament, serving in government, including in the ruling coalition, and as Supreme Court judges. 
For Czechia, it is unacceptable to associate current events in the State of Israel with the situation of apartheid in South Africa. We consider this both a misunderstanding of completely different historical and political contexts and an open anti-Semitism that needs to be combated. The suffering of innocent South Africans living under the apartheid regime was unique and the attempts to apply the same label to Israel trivializes that history and is totally unacceptable. Czechia has been a leading voice within the European Union in strengthening the ties between the EU and the Jewish state. The apartheid label seeks to undermine our shared values and interests, denying the Jewish state, their Jewish people, their right to self-determination, for example, by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor, is a violation of the working definition of anti-Semitism adopted by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Sadly, we have witnessed a rise in violent anti-Semitism in Europe, and reject rejecting the apartheid claim is integral in our approach to protecting our local Jewish communities, who are often the first target of such hateful rhetoric. Czechia opposes institutional bias against Israel also in the United Nations. Such bias is currently exemplified by the first report of June 7, 2022 in the Human Rights Council's Commission of Inquiry. We fear that such initiatives are designed to facilitate investigations of Israelis by the International Criminal Court. Czechia is committed to preventing and combating anti-Semitism on all fronts. Right now, we are working on the Czech National Strategy for Combating Anti-Semitism. As part of our upcoming Presidency of the Council of the European Union in the second half of this year, we are organizing a follow-up international conference to the Terezin Declaration endorsed by 47 countries during our first EU Presidency in 2009. We believe that education is a key to combating anti-Semitism. Therefore, we founded a state-subsidized institution called Memorial of Silence. The institution will commemorate the victims of the Holocaust and will serve as a Holocaust education center for people of all ages. The institution will also focus on comparison of the experiences from the past with current signs of xenophobia and anti-Semitism. We believe that the future of the region lies in the Abraham Accords and increased normalization between Israel and the Arab world. We are committed to a directly negotiated two-state solution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and support an initiative that would lead to a just and lasting peace between Israelis and Palestinians. We believe in a course where bridges are built and gaps are narrowed. There is no place for an apartheid label in our views. Like any country, Israel is not perfect and can be legitimately criticized for its actions. But claims of apartheid are not about questioning specific policies, but challenging the idea of the Jewish state as such. The future of coexistence between Israelis and Palestinians is in the hands of both sides. They need to show goodwill for their coexistence while demonstrating humility and understanding for each other's aspirations. Thank you, and I wish you to have a fruitful discussion. Thank you, Deputy Minister, for your effort in denouncing the apartheid narrative of Israel and for your commitment to the Jewish people, including for the Jewish citizens of the Czech Republic. Your efforts are truly needed and appreciated. It's now our distinct honor to welcome Parliament member Anthony Housefather, member of the House of Commons of Canada and representative of Mount Royal, Montreal, Quebec. Parliament member Housefather serves as both the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, as well as Chair of the Canada-Israel Interparliamentary Group. Mr. Housefather is also a founding member of the Interparliamentary Task Force to Combat Online Anti-Semitism, a cross-party group of lawmakers from Israel, the U.S., Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom. Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Housefather, and I'm a member of the Canadian Parliament. 
It has never been more important that elected officials from across the world speak out against attempts to delegitimize the state of Israel, particularly as these attempts are increasingly brought into the mainstream by organizations, including the UN Human Rights Council. The characterization of Israel as an apartheid state is both wrong and offensive. It is also a particularly dangerous label. This pernicious campaign undermines the very nature of the country by arguing that Israel is inherently criminal and therefore illegitimate. It is critical that we expose this libel for what it is, legally, historically, and factually baseless. First of all, the indigenous relationship of the Jewish people to the Israeli territory must not be discounted particularly as those who seek to delegitimize Israel, continuously deride it as a settler colonial project. There has been a persistent Jewish presence in the land of Israel for 3,500 years, and the Jews' return to Israel is just that, a return, not an attempt at colonization. The use of white settler colonial terminology in relation to Israel and to Zionism inaccurately ties the national aspirations of an indigenous group within its historical territory to the historical colonial projects of European countries, there is no such link. The allegation that Israel is guilty of apartheid also ignores the reality on the ground. Arab citizens of Israel enjoy rights equal to Jewish Israelis. Arab citizens of Israel make up a large percentage of the country's pharmacists, doctors, and entrepreneurs. Arabs serve in parliament, the judiciary, and the consular corps. While there is certainly evidence that Arab communities in Israel deserve greater support from the state, there is no apartheid in Israel. In addition to being offensive to Israel and supporters of Israel across the world, this characterization diminishes the horrific experience of those who suffered under apartheid in South Africa. Using the term apartheid as a tool to attack and delegitimize Israel by the way, the only truly democratic state in the Middle East, disrespects the struggle of South Africans against apartheid. By denying these fundamental facts, influential organizations like Amnesty International and the UN Human Rights Council have used their legitimacy and reputations to market their false advertising to people of goodwill all over the world who stand against crimes against humanity and human rights abuses. We are seeing and the summer of 2021 is a good example of this, how the anti-Israel campaign of those organizations has been adopted by well-meaning people the world over. The results are downright dangerous. Just recently, in May of last year, during the Israel-Hamas conflict, we saw many anti-Israel protests across Canada. I will reiterate, I will always protect the right of all Canadians to express their opinions peacefully and lawfully. However, these protests frequently turn violent. Some of the protesters openly express their support for Hamas, a terrorist entity whose mission statement is to destroy the state of Israel. There were stones thrown at Jews outside the Israeli consulate in Montreal, and visibly Jewish individuals were attacked and berated with the anti-Israel rhetoric devolving into anti-Semitism. B'nai B'rith recorded a 54% increase in violent incidents in May 2021 over the same period in 2020. Indeed, during this period, anti-Semitic activists drove through my own district and threatened to harm Jews. For the first time as an elected official, I had Jewish constituents who were afraid to send their children to the park and asked if they should take off their kippahs or remove their mezuzahs from their doors. I never thought I would see this happen in Canada. Holding Jewish Canadians responsible for the actions of Israel is the height of anti-Semitism and a consequence of the inflammatory language used by the anti-Israel community. This is just one example of how the false characterization of Israel as an apartheid state has real and very dangerous consequences. It also demonstrates how all too often legitimate criticism of the Israeli government is undermined by anti-Semites who claim to be anti-Israel to mask their anti-Semitism. When any organization or individual singles out Israel, and neglects to treat Israel as an equal member of the family of nations, they expose themselves for what they are, anti-Semitic. To have Israel as the sole permanent agenda item of the UNHCR is a clear example of this, dis this disproportionate focus 
on the world's only Jewish majority state. Anti-Semitism is the oldest form of hatred, and it continues to spread in new forms and under new disguises. I commit to continuing to work across party lines with legislators from around the world, continue to fight both anti-Semitism and unfair attacks against the state of Israel. As Parliament member Housefather has so eloquently proven to us, the apartheid narrative, which contributes to anti-Israel rhetoric, does evolve into anti-Semitism. We thank you, Parliament member Housefather, for your words and for your work in combating anti-Semitism both in Canada and across party and country lines. Next, we're going to speak with Vice President of the French Senate, Roger Carucci, who's represented the Health Design District since 2011. Senator Carucci, welcome. Amnesty International euh, parle d'apartheid dans l'État d'Israël. Évidemment que c'est un moyen de délégitimer l'État, que c'est un moyen de dire qu'il n'y a plus de règles, puisque le terme apartheid avait été évidemment utilisé pour l'Afrique du Sud. On sait ce que ça veut dire avec la lutte pour la décolonisation, la lutte pour l'indépendance revue par l'ANC. Et dans ces conditions, on sait très bien que c'était un moyen de délégitimer le régime blanc d'Afrique du Sud par rapport à l'ensemble de la population noire. Mais ça veut dire quoi pour Israël Ça veut dire que euh, l'État israélien, le gouvernement israélien, traite la population arabe d'Israël ou des territoires de la même manière que le régime blanc d'Afrique du Sud traitait la population noire qui était dans des townships. Bien entendu, personne n'y croit. L'État d'Israël est pratiquement le seul État du Moyen-Orient à être un État démocratique, où il y a des élections. D'ailleurs, un ministre dans l'actuelle coalition vient d'un parti arabe et est dans la coalition. Il y a des députés arabes à la Knesset. Il y a évidemment des chefs militaires, euh, des, 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 des professeurs d'université arabes un peu partout dans le pays. Par conséquent, la notion d'apartheid n'a pas de sens. Il est évident que la manière dont le gouvernement israélien et l'État israélien traitent la population arabe d'Israël n'a strictement rien à voir avec euh, la manière dont le régime raciste d'Afrique du Sud traitait la population noire. L'idée euh, sous-jacente en, en pratique de tout ça, c'est de dire ah, ça délégitime à la fois euh, l'ensemble des décisions prises par l'État d'Israël, ça délégitime le gouvernement israélien, et sous couvert de droits de l'homme, eh bien, par définition, on fait de l'antisionisme facile, et derrière l'antisionisme, quand même, de l'antisémitisme. Alors, est-ce que c'est responsable Naturellement que non, parce que euh, dans toute la presse, dans toutes les dépêches, dans le monde, on reprend les accusations, les attaques de ces organismes sur, sur l'État d'Israël. Et bien sûr, ça participe à ce grand mouvement qui, dans la pratique, est repris par tous les antisémites qui, soit dans les, la presse, soit sur les réseaux sociaux, s'attaquent à toutes les communautés juives un peu partout en Europe et probablement dans le monde. Est-ce que des attaques de ce genre ont quelque part une résonance pouvant conduire à des actes antisémites, bien sûr que oui. Bien sûr que oui, parce qu'il suffit de dire que c'est de l'apartheid et un peu partout dans le monde, un certain nombre de musulmans peuvent se dire c'est une juste cause que de lutter quelque part contre l'État d'Israël, peut-être indirectement contre les Juifs dans notre pays. Et donc forcément, cette volonté de parler d'apartheid, eh bien, euh, ça contribue à un climat anti antisémite en Europe et partout dans le monde. Donc, d'une part, il faut évidemment euh, nier euh, toute, euh, toute politique d'apartheid, nier euh, le, le, ce réflexe raciste qu'aurait euh, le gouvernement israélien par rapport aux populations arabes, et d'autre part, vérifier, lutter un peu partout dans le monde contre les actes antisémites, qu'ils soient d'ailleurs directement liés à ces attaques ou à d'autres. Mais on sent bien qu'il y a euh, une difficulté au moment où Israël, euh, avec les accords que, que l'État israélien passe avec le Maroc, avec les Émirats, comme il, a passé, comme il en a passé dans, dans le passé, avec l'Égypte ou avec la Jordanie. Et évidemment que les accords d'Abraham, ça gêne. 
clairement ça gêne parce que ça donne le sentiment que l'État d'Israël parle, négocie, discute, traite avec des États arabes de manière tout à fait classique, normale et avec de vrais accords économiques, politiques, militaires. Voilà. Donc euh, il faut un peu saper cette vision des accords d'Abraham, saper les tentatives actuelles du gouvernement israélien de s'ouvrir et de faire en sorte qu'il euh, y ait évidemment une place pour Israël dans, dans, dans la scène mondiale. Je, je considère que c'est évidemment extrêmement coupable de faire ça parce que euh, tout le monde a intérêt à un rapprochement entre Israël et les États arabes, tout le monde a intérêt à ce que les choses puissent se, se discuter, sauf peut-être des petits groupes qui ont un intérêt particulier à ce que ça ne se fasse pas, et qui ont intérêt à parler d'apartheid, à faire de l'antisionisme, etc. Mais tout ça est, est extrêmement provocateur. Et en tout cas, clairement, en France, on a décidé de ne pas tenir compte de ces accusations, de ne pas les considérer comme valides, et à partir de là, de lutter contre la désinformation liée à cela. D'où le fait qu'il y a beaucoup d'expositions, beaucoup de débats, beaucoup de colloques sur la politique israélienne, non seulement en Israël, mais par rapport aux États arabes. Nous avons fait ici au Sénat un colloque sur les accords d'Abraham. Il y en aura d'autres. Et je souhaite très vivement que dans le monde entier, ce type d'action neutralise ces accusations sans fondement sur une politique d'apartheid en Israël. Thank you, Senator Carucci, for your remarks. Your participation in this forum is greatly appreciated. Next, we'll hear from Dietmar Koster, a German member of the EU Parliament who serves on the body's committee on foreign affairs, where he's been active in building stronger EU-Israel relations. MEP Koster, welcome. Thank you for allowing me to address you today. The fight against anti-Semitism has always been at the top of my political agenda. I have dedicated myself to bringing Israel and its people closer to the European Union and consolidating EU support for the State of Israel, which is the only democracy in the Middle East. I see it as a European responsibility to support you on your mission of building a safe and peaceful country. And we need to work outside of Israel as well, starting in Europe, where anti-Semitism has been increasing steadily again. We cannot accept anti-Semitism anywhere. And it is clearly wrong to describe Israel as an apartheid state. As you all know, this outrageous claim that has functioned to demonize the country was recently made in a report by Amnesty International and before that by other organizations and has since been repeated by others, most notably the United Nations Special Rapporteur for the Situation of Human Rights in the Palestinian Territory, Michael Dink. His sentiments have echoed through the entire UN. All of these reports have been issued by an by and discussed in respected organizations. This makes it even more remarkable how incredibly false, factually inaccurate and one-sided they are. These reports are not a neutral discussion of the political realities in Israel, but are clearly and shamelessly anti-Israel propaganda. Anybody that looks closely and what apartheid actually means will easily find that there is no basis given to use this term to describe Israel. The most important defining characteristics of an apartheid state are the complete segregation of inhabitants with different backgrounds. This also includes a rigid separation of groups in public spaces and positions of power. Israel different from South Africa during the apartheid regime, is a multi-ethnic society and the Arab minority is invited to actively participate in the political process. Arab citizens have full rights under Israeli law. They of course also enjoy the right to vote and are represented in the Knesset and are part of the actual government. 
Israeli Arabs attend the same schools and universities as everyone else and can pursue the same careers as every other citizen of Israel. Instead of throwing around apartheid allegations and stirring up hatred, we must instead work together to create a safe environment for the people of Israel and Jews around the world. Human rights organizations must work alongside national governments and international organizations to tackle anti-Semitism everywhere. We must ensure that Jews everywhere can live and practice their faith safely and freely. We cannot forget the fear that Jewish people live with constantly. I would like to leave with you with this. The Jewish community is not alone. They are dedicated supporters. We stand with you and we remain vigilant. Thank you. Thank you, Member of Parliament Coaster, for those meaningful words, as well as your advocacy against anti-Semitism and your belief in the critical importance of EU-Israel relations. We now have the privilege of being joined by another member of the EU Parliament's Committee on Foreign Affairs, Parliament Member David Lega of Sweden, who's also sought to forge tighter ties between Europe and Israel. Member of Parliament Lega, thank you so much for being here. Dear friends, colleagues, and everyone who is attending this important online forum on anti-Semitism arranged by Combat Anti-Semitism Movement. The recent accusations of Israel being an apartheid state by some human rights organizations is extremely dangerous. It portrays Israel as a racist state. It delegitimizes Israel's right to exist. It even contributes to the global rise of anti-Semitism. My name is David Lega and I'm a member of the European Parliament representing Sweden. I am a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee where we focus on EU's relations with the rest of the world. One of my primary focus is on Israel. Furthermore, as a member of the Subcommittee on Human Rights, I also work with promoting human rights and fundamental freedoms. And I'm also a member of the European Parliament's working group against anti-Semitism. And to give you a more concrete example, I have recently been working on the infamous Palestinian textbooks. These textbooks are used in the UNRWA-sponsored schools. So why are they infamous? The material used in these schools is teaching Palestinian pupils to hate the Jewish people. The material incites to violence, glorifies gruesome terrorist activities, and rejects peace between Israel and Arab states. A recent study by Georg Eckert Institute concluded that the curriculum does not meet the UNESCO standards of peace, tolerance and nonviolence. So how is this relevant in the European Union? The Palestinian Authority has for years been receiving funds from EU taxpayers' funds that have gone directly to hate and anti-Semitism. And I, as a member of the European Parliament, who places above all the values of tolerance, justice, solidarity and non-discrimination, find it disgraceful that the appropriation of such values are used to justify hatred. The EU funding to the Palestinian Authority has been blocked since last year when the Commission imposed conditionality on it. But when visiting Ramallah in the West Bank last week, Ursula von der Leyen announced that the EU would unblock funding to the Palestinian Authority. And I find this extremely frustrating. I am a firm supporter of assistance to vulnerable groups and aid to education, but funds cannot be granted without conditionality. Our taxpayers' money should not fund hatred. So I have raised this critical issue with the President of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and also with High Representative Joseph Borrell. There is a dire need for oversight, transparency and accountability regarding the repeated teaching of hate and incitement to Palestinian children. The Commission has promised and resolved to zero tolerance against anti-Semitism and still it funds hate speech against the Jewish people. We must see a real commitment to zero tolerance, both in internal and external policies of the EU. Multilateral organizations have not treated Israel like a developed democratic state 
and the EU's lack of willingness to enhance cooperation with Israel is clear due to the fact that no EU-Israel Association Council meeting has been held since 2012. Furthermore, there is a clear bias against Israel in the UN. There have been more than 100 resolutions in the UN Security Council against Israel, and there is a standing commission of inquiry no other country is being targeted by the United Nations to this extent. So questions arise. Why does the EU not want to enhance its cooperation and dialogue with the only democratic states in the Middle East? Why does the UN treat Israel like a villain state? The preferential treatment of Palestinians must also be addressed. The UNRWA is a UN body formed in 1949 to resolve the situation of the 700,000 Palestinian refugees fleeing the territories of the newly formed State of Israel. The initial idea was that the UNRWA would be a temporary institution. However, today, more than 70 years later, the number of Palestinian refugees is well over 5 million. Unlike any other refugees, the Palestinian refugee status is inherited. So why are the Palestinian refugees not handled under the same organization like the rest of the refugees in the world? Finally, I want to re-emphasize how absurd it is that human rights organizations claim that Israel is engaged in apartheid. I am deeply disturbed about the obvious biases against the only democratic state in the Middle East. In fact, two million Arabs fully enjoy their civil and political rights to vote to be elected, to serve in government, and to pursue all professions in Israel. What kind of apartheid system would allow that? Regrettably, this smear campaign will effectively decrease the prospects for the peaceful two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Many people claim to strive towards a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but unless we stop feeding children with hate, how will the next generation have a chance to live in peace? Therefore, we need to continue to work together to make a sustainable difference. Thank you, Parliament Member Lega, for your remarks and the role that you play in bringing Europe and Israel closer together. Up next, we're now going to Holland to hear from veteran Dutch parliamentarian Kies van der Stey leader of the Reformed Political Party. Parliament member van der Stey, welcome. Dear friends of Israel and of the Jewish people, apartheid is probably one of the most well-known words of the Dutch language. And for me as a Dutch politician, it's an uncomfortable truth. Because we all know that apartheid is an electrically charged concept, referring to the shameful, controversial system that existed in South Africa from 1948 until 1994. The term apartheid was catapulted into history in 1948 when the Afrikaanse Nationale Partij used it in its meaning of segregation on the basis of race. And since then, a system of segregation was indeed installed, maintained, until it was terminated after broad pressure from the international community. So, apartheid, it was clear, it was generally rejected, apartheid is wrong. However, since the 19th, the concept of apartheid was not only used for South Africa, but increasingly used for other purposes, such as the suppression of Afro-Americans in the US. And it became a useful label for many different groups that feel discriminated to put their issue on the international agenda. agenda. And when you said apartheid, it was clear without argumentation that it's wrong, false. One would think that this often superficial or far-fetched use of the concept of apartheid 
leads to an erosion of its original painful meaning. But even if this is the case in a psychological or social sense, this is certainly not the case from an international legal perspective. And that's exactly why using the term against Israel is so dangerous. The Statute of Rome still refers to the crime of apartheid as, and I quote, inhuman acts committed in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression and domination by one racial group over any other racial group or groups and committed with the intention of maintaining that regime, end of quote. This fairly reality, the combination of quick and easy usage, but legal severity, is precisely why it's so wrong, painful and shameful to apply it intentionally and hatefully to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And that UN bodies and international human rights organizations take the lead. Unbelievable. Even at the beginning of this year, a fellow parliamentarian asked our Minister of Foreign Affairs rather aggressive questions about the amnesty report on Israel's apartheid against Palestinians. And she asked which effective measures our government would take to end this and went on and went on to refer to Israel as an apartheid bewind, apartheid regime. I was relieved to read in the official response that our minister does not agree with organizations labeling the Israeli-Palestinian situation as apartheid. And our minister criticized their research methodology and far-reaching conclusions. And in fact, he stressed that Israel is a pluralistic, democratic state with rule of law and a powerful representation mirroring all communities and ethnicities within the Israeli society. So it's wrong, it's not helpful, it's only giving polarization and making accusations without ground. And for all those reasons, my party and I personally strongly believe that organizations should stop using disqualifications. Not only because it indeed trivializes history, but also because it violates the present. It is not rooted in reality and it insults Israel. And therefore we will continue to urge our government to speak out against this blatant hypocrisy. And we will urge our government to vote more often against the biased and one-sided UN resolutions against Israel. And we will continue to urge our government to strengthen its ties and positive cooperation with Israel and the Jewish people. Let me conclude. For all those reasons, I ask you all to stand with Israel against the apartheid claim. Thank you very much and all the best. Thank you, Parliament Member Van Der Stey, for your valued insights on this topic and your friendship with the State of Israel and the Jewish people. We now move to the United Kingdom for remarks from Welsh Parliament Member Darren Miller, who has a long track record of pro-Israel advocacy. Parliament Member Miller, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Shalom and greetings from Wales. Today, I'm proud to be standing with Israel and against anti-Semitism. You know, using the word apartheid and associating it with the state of Israel is wrong and it's dangerous. But unfortunately, organizations like Amnesty International and the UN Human Rights Council have used that term in reports which they have published. I believe those reports are politicized and that they are malicious in their nature. You know, using the word apartheid to describe the Israeli state simply trivializes the awful human suffering that millions of people experienced at the hands of the apartheid regimes in South Africa. And using that word also fuels and fans the flame of anti-Semitism worldwide. 
initiatives like uh, Israel uh, Apartheid Week, for example, are nothing more than an attempt to be anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic. And that's why I'm standing shoulder to shoulder with the combat anti-Semitism movement, because I don't want to see that word apartheid hijacked by those who are simply anti the state of Israel and anti the Jewish people. So I make a pledge. I make a pledge today and every day that I will stand up for the nation of Israel, that I will speak out when I see the word apartheid being hijacked, and that I will stand up and have my voice heard. I hope that you'll make the same pledge too. Be sure that Israel has many friends in Wales and we continue to stand against anti-Semitism wherever we see it. Thank you. Thank you, Parliament Member Miller, for those resounding sentiments and your passion for forging friendly bonds between Wales and the State of Israel. Up next, returning to the Netherlands, we're going to speak with Dutch EU Parliament member Bert Jan Roosen, who serves as vice chair of the body's delegation for relations with Israel. Parliament member Roosen, welcome to our program. Thirty-one years ago, the United Nations General Assembly took the wise and the right decision to revoke its worst resolution ever adopted. Resolution 3379, which had equated Zionism with racism. By taking this decision, the UN determined that Zionism is not a form of racism. How astonishing is the fact that many do not seem to learn from history. How sad is it that last year, Human Rights Watch barely a year later followed by Amnesty International, accused Israel of pursuing an apartheid policy versus the Palestinians. And how sad it is that the UN Human Rights Council, sadly known for its anti-Israel bias, established a commission of inquiry responsible for investigating, quote, systematic discrimination and repression based on national, ethnic, racial or religious identity by Israel. This is language previously used to allege that Israel is guilty of apartheid policies. Apparently, the racism-Zionism equation is back in a new format. Old wine in new bottles. The allegations against Israel are completely devoid of reality and at odds with the international legal consensus. Unfortunately, the denial of the only Jewish state's right to exist, according to standards that are not used for any state, is now accepted. I come across a shocking example revealed by a Jewish student at the Dutch University. Last year, one of the university teachers sent all her students an email via the university system to urge the students to participate in a pro-Palestine demonstration against apartheid, Israel and the so-called genocide. As some described it, we may call this the new anti-Semitism. Stating that Israel is an apartheid state would fall under the definition of anti-Semitism. Apartheid is a very distinct crime that, according to international consensus, has been committed in his history just once. The term should not be misused and certainly not for political purposes. The situation in South Africa during parts of the 20th century can by no means be compared with the situation in Israel. Apartheid is a system of segregation that goes, goes against all the values and principles that Israel represents since its foundation. Israel's Declaration of Independence states that Arab inhabitants of Israel 
are being promised full and equal citizenship and due representation in its provisional or permanent institutions. This promise was put in practice. Just look at the current government that includes Arab parties, which shows that political diversity is enshrined in Israel's government policy institutions. Criticism to a country's policies can be good and is sometimes very justified. The boundary is where there is no longer, longer any criticism of policy, but where the existence of the state is denied. If the goal is to eliminate the only Jewish state in the world, then Jews are stigmatized and isolated. Putting an apartheid label goes beyond particular policies and will also be used as a justification for the destructive BDS campaigns. The NGOs that accuse Israel of the crime of apartheid undermine their own credibility as their accusations are unreal and not based on facts on the ground. It does not have a positive contribution to the peace process either. We should firmly stand up against such deliberate attempts to delegitimize the state of Israel and against the accompanying anti-Semitic rhetoric. Thank you, Parliament Member Rusin, for your comments and for your work to fortify Europe-Israel ties. Turning now to the United States, we go to Washington, D.C. for remarks from Congressman Henry Cuellar. Representing the 28th Congressional District of Texas, Congressman Cuellar has long been a leading voice in decrying anti-Semitism and pushing back against attempts to delegitimize Israel. Congressman Cuellar, take it away. Hello, this is Congressman Henry Cuellar. This year, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch released reports accusing Israel of apartheid. This is a dangerous statement and one that has no merit. I reject this comparison. Israel is a free, democratic state, a state that has government formed by coalitions of opposing parties representing many demographics. In fact, Israel is widely known as the only democratic nation in the Middle East. Attempts to link South Africa's past system of institutionalized racial segregation to the nuanced complexity of contemporary Israeli-Palestinian relations debase history and trivializes the unique suffering true South African apartheid victims endured for so many years. The United States values its strong relationship with the State of Israel. I'm proud to work with leaders here in Congress and across the world to improve all lives in Israel, Jewish lives, Arab lives, and Druze lives. However, we must also acknowledge the dangerous effects of falsified name-calling. Globally, the Jewish community has been targeted by many acts against them. In fact, the Jewish Agency and the World Zionist Organization, they estimate that in 2021 was the worst year in decades for the anti-Semitism across the world. Within the United States, New York saw a 100% increase in 503 anti-Semitic incidents in 2021. I'm saddened by this unacceptable behavior. We should not have that now. I'm also worried about the safety of my Jewish friends, but I'm also comforted by the fact that Congress, we here in Congress, we continue supporting the Jewish state by any means necessary. I'm a proud supporter of the democratic, inclusive Jewish state of Israel. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you, Congressman Cuellar, for your important words and your deep commitment to the U.S.-Israel alliance. It's now our honor and privilege to turn our attention to Baroness Ruth Deitch, member of the House of Lords of the United Kingdom. 
The Baroness has previously served as the director of JNF UK. She's a patron of UK Lawyers for Israel, and she's spoken up on behalf of Israel and on the dangers of anti-Semitism in the House of Lords on many occasions. Baroness Dietsch, welcome. If there is one thing that the history of the Jews tells us, it is that the attacks on them go back thousands of years. And whatever the world's greatest and most unforgivable crime is of any period of history, the Jews will be accused of it. And now, because it is the world's worst crime, Jews are accused of apartheid or racial discrimination. So what is this apartheid that Israel is accused of? We know it very well because we saw it in South Africa. We're forcibly segregated based on the color of a person's skin. The police, the government, the judicial system, hospitals, civil service, transport and education in South Africa were all organized along strict rules of black and white and categories in between. But South African black people will tell you now that they know that this has no bearing on Israel. They remember when they needed permission to live in white areas, couldn't marry a white person, had no vote, no representation in parliament. They note with astonishment that a former president of Israel, Katzel, appeared and was sentenced before an Arab judge, Kara, in Israel. Nothing comparable could have happened under South African apartheid. Israel is a multiracial, multi-religious democracy. Minorities have basic rights guaranteed. They vote. There are no legal restrictions on movement or marital relations. There is free speech even to oppose Zionism. And most Arabs living in Israel say they prefer to be there and to have Israeli citizenship rather than go elsewhere. That may be because they have more civic, religious and sexual rights in Israel than they have in nearly all the Muslim countries that surround it, and in particular in Gaza and the West Bank, where freedom lovers would find life intolerable. Indeed, it is those who accuse Israel of apartheid that are themselves racist, in that their real motive is to deny the legitimacy of the only Jewish state in the world, and if heaven forbid they got their way, they would return Jews to dispersion, slaughter, and discrimination all over the world. Even Richard Goldstone, the South African jurist not known for his support of Israel, has said that there is no apartheid in Israel with its Arab population of 20% who vote and hold high positions. Occupation is not apartheid. Occupation is about a territory whose sovereignty is disputed and where it would be regarded as a takeover if Israeli law would apply to those who live under the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. Discrimination and poverty which exist are not apartheid either. They exist even in the United Kingdom and America, where minorities may not speak English or fail to take advantage of the education system. The right of return to Israel is not dissimilar from the immigration laws of many countries, every one of which claims to control immigration and nationality by some sort of test relating to a bond with the land. The root of this calumny lies in the perverted 1975 Zionism is Racism United Nations Resolution, which has been resurrected at every Durban conference since, in order to distract attention from the appalling records of the countries that support it. The time has come when the UN is more of a danger than a benefit to the world. Israel is accused of being a Jewish state, as if there were a, that was a crime in itself. But how many Muslim states are there? In 26 countries, the state religion is Islam and often nothing else is allowed. And in twice as many, there are majority Muslim populations. In the United Kingdom, 26 bishops sit in the House of Lords. And the only other country with clerics in the legislature is Iran. The Church of England was invented for English purposes and is so prevalent and embedded in our way of life 
in Britain, that it is not perceived for what it is, permeating holidays, broadcasting, education, certain jobs, even the monarchy. Sadly, students on campus have found a cause to rally freshers, namely Israel Apartheid Week. This is contrary to our law on equality and charities, but it has succeeded in influencing a future generation of our leaders. We know why this toxic word apartheid is being used. The Palestinian Authority wants to delegitimize and dismantle Israel and overrun the land from the river to the sea without a Jewish presence. It was the South African regime that was targeted by the word apartheid. But in the case of Israel, those who use it want the end of the state itself. Jews must fight and fight again for a tiny piece of territory, Israel, where they can live as Jews, free from persecution, and provide a haven for Jews who are persecuted in the rest of the world or who want to come home. Thank you, Baroness, for your contribution to the discussion on the nuance of the apartheid narrative and its implications for not only Jews, but for South Africans as well. And thank you, of course, for your important work in combating anti-Semitism in the United Kingdom. We now welcome the esteemed Frank Mueller Rosentritt, member of the German Bundestag. Parliament member Rosentritt has been a true friend of Israel. Only a month ago, he accompanied the mayor of Kiryat Bialik here in Israel for the official ceremony of the signing of a twin city agreement between Kiryat Bialik and Chemnitz. In June, Frank Mueller Rosentritt initiated the first German-Israeli SME Day in Chemnitz, attended by companies from both Israel and Germany. Hello and shalom from the German Bundestag, here live from Berlin. Many thanks to the NGO Monitor and to the Combat Antisemitism Movement for inviting me to give a short speech at this online forum. As a member of Parliament for the FDP, a Liberal Party group in Germany and one of the three parties of the German government coalition and as member of the Committee for Foreign Affairs, I'm glad to speak to you about the apartheid label that is used to attack the Jewish state. To make it quite clear at the beginning, everyone who has been in Israel or gets unbiased reports about the country and its people should know that there is no apartheid in the only democratic state in the Middle East and Israel. Israel is a very diverse society with many different religious, ethnic and political groups that are represented in the Knesset. Calling Israel an apartheid state is a blatant lie that is part of the anti-Semitic efforts to delegitimize and demonize the Jew state. Of course, the German government and the vast majority of German politicians do not adopt the apartheid claim. But nonetheless, we have to cope with this labeling and singling out of Israel. In February 2022, Amnesty International published a report about, quote, Israel's system of apartheid and called for demolishing it. The German branch of Amnesty International gave a statement that they would not further promote this report due to the sensitive situation in Germany. But they did not distance themselves from the accusation of this report. The German government rejects the use of terms such as apartheid in connection with Israel. As a spokesperson for the German Foreign Ministry underlined in a statement shortly after the Amnesty report was published. This month, the Commission of Inquiry of the United Nations Human Rights Council released a report condemning the Jew state. The Commission Chair Navy Pillai is bluntly using the term apartheid. But Germany has been one of the 22 countries led by the US that used a harsh rebuke on this report, saying that this commission is a further demonstration of long-standing disproportionate attention 
given to Israel in the Council and must stop. In our coalition agreement, the FDP, together with the SPD and the Green Party, vote to block anti-Semitic attempts to condemn Israel also at the UN. And I was personally one of the guy who was in process of negotiating this contract. And in a resolution against BDS that has been adopted by the German Bundestag in 2019, we pledge that Germany will strongly oppose efforts to defame Jews or the question the Jewish and democratic state of Israel right to exist or right to self-defense. I will further work to ensure that this is Germany or that is German policy and Staatsraison. And I'm happy that there are so many who are working against the apartheid label in Israel, Germany and other countries and at the UN. Thank you very much. Thank you, Parliament Member Rosentritt, for firmly denouncing the claim that Israel is an apartheid state and for your continued friendship and support for Israel. Your work is very much appreciated. Next, staying in Europe, we're joined by Spanish European Parliament Member Antonio López Isturiz White, Chair of the Delegation for Relations with Israel. It is a shame that in this day and age, historical revisionism and anti-Semitic claims still exist. Too many people and organizations wrongly accuse Israel of practicing an apartheid regime. The comparison is not only inaccurate. Indeed, it has been rejected by those with any understanding of the old apartheid system. Israel is a multiracial and multicolored society, and the Arab minority participates in the political process. Incitement to racism and discrimination on the basis of race or religion is a criminal offense. The comparison is also morally wrong. It usually seeks to legitimize Israel itself. Sadly, too many people still believe that Israel does not have the right to exist. The truth is that Israel is a stable and prosperous democracy, home to more than 9 million people whose fundamental rights are protected by the rule of law. It is an ally of the European Union and a force for good in the region. The apartheid comparison also reflects the deep hypocrisy and double standards apply to Israel. The accusation of apartheid is made because Israel is considered a Jewish state, yet some of its citizens follow other religions. Yet these accusers stay silent when Arab states call themselves Arab republics, which of course they have the right to do. Yet it is Israel which is constantly attacked by the media, international bodies and NGOs in that sense, anti-Semitism cannot be allowed to continue our public discourse and our politics. It must be fought with the same passion than any other form of discrimination. Let me finish by saying that we must support the Middle East peace process, a process based on a two-state solution with a secure state of Israel and an independent, democratic, viable Palestinian state living side by side in peace and security. Any claim that seeks to divide and incite hate will only stand in the way of this great objective. Thank you, Parliament Member López Isturiz White, for your thoughts on this issue and your steadfast support for Israel. We're now privileged to hear from European Parliament Member and Vice Chair of the Budgetary Committee, Nicolas Herbst. Thank you, Parliament Member Herbst, for your friendship and vocal support for the State of Israel in your capacity as Vice Chair of the Budget Committee. Amnesty International is calling Israel uh, an apartheid regime. 
uh, because of the situation of Palestinians in Israel. And I think uh, this is really misleading, this is unfair, but unfortunately other foundations, other organizations are following this example and we have to say stop because this is absolutely misleading, it's uh, just not true. As we know, uh, Israel is the only functioning democracy uh, in the Middle East. Uh, you have freedom of speech, uh, freedom of press, um, uh, separation of powers. You have uh, very far-going uh, citizen rights for everybody, including um, Muslims and Arab Israelis. So this is just not true. And I think uh, a lot of political prisoners during the apartheid regime in South Africa, they would have loved to live like uh, Palestinians in Israel. Of course, things can get better. That's uh, the case in every democracy. And it's up to the political discussion and the political institutions to find better ways. But calling Israel an apartheid regime is not only untrue and unfair, it's also, um, it's also, it's also bad in terms of uh, social cohesion. And it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, we, don't, we shouldn't divide people, we should unite them. This is what the Israeli um, political institutions try to do every day. We should support them and we should be fair. Israel is definitely not an apartheid regime. Thank you, Parliament Member Herbs, for highlighting the dangers of the apartheid narrative and for your continued support to the State of Israel. We're now honored to hear from Annika Borg, Doctor of Theology and Priest in the Church of Sweden. She's received multiple awards from the Sweden-Israel Society for her activism within the Swedish Church. Dr. Borg is currently part of a research project to challenge the negative image of Israel within the Swedish Church. Thank you, Dr. Borg, for your efforts to defend the state of Israel. The apartheid smear and the accusations against Israel have a dark history. Origins can be found during the Cold War when the Soviet bloc, together with Islamist movements, sought to expand the concept of apartheid to demonize democratic states. The purpose of naming and blaming Israel for a pariah state was to expel the country out of the world community. The next step took place in the early 2000s when the anti-Semitic boycott movement, BDS, boycott, divestment and sanctions was formed. And we should call it by its correct name, Kaufnicht by Juden. The apartheid accusation against Israel is the boycott movement BDS tool for gaining support and legitimacy for a total boycott of Israel. BDS spread, spreads anti-Semitic propaganda in which Jews, for example, are portrayed as dogs who stole the land of Israel. The allegations about apartheid are of course not true. About 20% of Israel's population is Arab. They enjoy the same rights as others. Arabic is the second official language. Everyone has the right to vote and to participate in political and social life. Talking about Israel as an apartheid state is not based on facts, but the rhetoric is used to demonize However, the facts have not prevented the lies about Israel as an apartheid state from spreading and unfortunately growing. Most recently, the NGO Amnesty has completely lost its credibility when launching a nearly 300 pages long apartheid report that seeks to distort reality. Not totalitarian countries, such as totalitarian China or Iran, have been the subject of Amnesty's so-called investigation about apartheid, but so has democratic Israel. Today's anti-Semitic lie and myth about Jews is that Israel is an apartheid state. It is anti-Semitism in a modern form. I will now give you some examples from my immediate context, the Church of Sweden. And as I do so, please want you to remember that Israel and the Jewish community 
all over the world. I have many, many friends in the Church of Sweden and in my country, Sweden. But we also have problems with our anti-Israeli and sometimes also anti-Semitic network or cluster in the church. Persons with power and positions and groups with influence who initiate activities and spread propaganda against Israel and against Jews. The Church of Sweden is one of the world's largest evangelical Lutheran church. Seen to the members, approximately today 5.7 million members in a small country like Sweden, and until recently, 7 million members. During the autumn last year, 2021, the Church Synod decided to work for an investigation of Israel as an apartheid state on the basis of the international laws on crimes against humanity. This unfortunate and horrible apartheid decision didn't occur in a vacuum. In fact, it was a culmination of decades of rhetoric and systematic political advocacy against Israel in these networks in the church and not free, infrequently with an anti-Semitic bias. When Israel is criticized for being in its very existence a racist state, it is an expression of anti-Semitism. When parallels are drawn between Israel and Nazis' crimes against humanity, it is anti-Semitism. Once again, remember that Israel and the Jewish community all over the world have many friends in the church, and that this decision, despite its awful content, opened even more eyes in the church and in the Swedish society as a whole. These people, they do now see and understand what antisemitism and hatred is. Thank you for your attention. Together we keep up the important and good work for a world without antisemitism. We will not rest and we will never give up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Borg, for your dedication to fighting anti-Semitism. And as you said, the apartheid narrative is part of a modern day form of anti-Semitism and this rhetoric needs to be put to an end. Now, let's cross the Atlantic Ocean again to Latin America for remarks from Honduran diplomat Miguel Munoz Valdiano, former chief of cooperation and trade affairs at the Embassy of Honduras in Israel. Mr. Munoz, thank you for joining us today. During my three years working in Israel on faith-based diplomacy issues and interreligious dialogue for peace, these are my take on the claims that apartheid is allegedly occurring here amid nuanced complexities of the Israeli-Palestinian relations. I have seen citizens being kind in the supermarket train station and hospital to any other citizen who asks for help without discrimination regarding their racial appearance. I have seen university students dialogue frankly and respectfully without attempting to discount opinions from Jewish, Christians, Arab, Jews, or even agnostic background. I have seen public servants being respectful of their social activities and religious acts of all citizens and their colleagues. For example, police officers of Arab origin serve the community together with police officers of Jewish heritage. I have seen Arab business people in Hebron giving work to Jewish workers and Jewish business people in Samaria giving jobs to Palestinian workers. I have seen how they all eat lunch together at the same table. I see that Israel, its leaders and its citizens are the most interested in showing and proving what their prophet says they are. Lights for the earth, repairers of the world, tikkun, Olam. I believe that they want to achieve fruits of peace 
like the ones that the great prophet Isaiah wrote in chapter 19. On that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian will come to Egypt. The Egyptians to Assyrians, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. On that day, Israel, along with Egypt and Assyria, will be a blessing in the midst of the earth. As a human rights advocate and a defender of freedom of thought, conscience, and religions, I do not think Israel is a racist state. Thank you, Diplomat Munoz, for your insights and the part you played in fostering the deep friendship between Honduras and Israel. We're now privileged to welcome Mr. Michael Freilich, member of federal parliament in Belgium. At the forefront of combating anti-Semitism, Michael Freilich, great supporter of the state of Israel, called on the Belgian government to cancel its Durban conference attendance in 2021. Anti-Israel activists have recently hijacked the label apartheid. This is deeply disturbing to me for two reasons. First of all, it trivializes the discrimination that black Africans really experienced for years under the terrible apartheid regime. And on the other hand, it labels Israel as discriminatory while it calls its inhabitants, both Muslims and Jews, oppressors. But as we all know, it is just the Jewish people who have, throughout our long history, been oppressed and discriminated against. Unfortunately, the same hypocrisy can also be found in our own Belgian parliament. Here too, left-wing parties under the banner of the Socialists and the Greens openly call for a boycott of the State of Israel, while on the other hand, they refuse to take the same stand against Hezbollah, for example. What these parties always forget to mention is that there is also an Arab governing party in the current Israeli government. Israel is not only the holy land for Jews, it is open to all other religions and faiths. Recently, I met with the Israeli Minister of Immigration and Absorption, Panina Tamano Shata. She's born of Ethiopian descent. And just a few weeks ago, the Israeli minister, Isawe Frey, was in Belgium. While last year, Amir Ohana, Israel Justice Minister and poster boy of the Israeli LGBTQ movement, came to Belgium. And what all of this shows is that Israel is a vibrant democracy with respect for human rights and tolerance for all. Claiming that Israel is an apartheid state is therefore absurd and shameful. Furthermore, Israel is closing peace deals with ever more Arab countries. Starting with Egypt and Jordan many years ago, Israel now also boasts a comprehensive peace agreement with the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Oman, Morocco and more. In conclusion, those who label Israel as an apartheid state do not yearn for peace. On the contrary, their main motivation is loathing and jealousy. We will not let these hate mongers achieve what they want. I will keep fighting these evil forces here in the Belgian parliament and wherever I find them. Our ultimate goal is peace. That is the ultimate goal of the Jewish people, of the state of Israel, and of the many like-minded allies and friends. Shalom, salam, peace to all. Michael Freilich from the Belgian parliament in Brussels. Thank you, Parliament Member Freilich, for your hard work in defending Israel and for advocating against the apartheid narrative that surrounds it. And with that, we've come to the conclusion of our event today. Remember, if you missed or wish to rewatch any portion of the program, you'll receive a recap in your inbox, and a full recording is going to be made available on the event's website and the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement's social media platforms. 
We'd like to once again express our gratitude to our speakers from around the world for joining us. And of course, for their leadership in advocating for and defending the state of Israel and Jewish communities worldwide. And thank you, our viewers, for taking the time to be with us. We hope you learned a lot and are inspired to take an active role in the campaign launched by the Combat Anti-Semitism Movement and NGO Monitor to fight the apartheid slander of Israel. Please stay tuned for future communications about programs and initiatives that you can join as part of this effort. Only through collective action at both the grassroots and policy levels can we affect the change that we wish to see in the world. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and goodbye for now.